Hey everyone, welcome back to our online beer tastings. We're going to do a little bit of head to head tonight. A little apricot versus apricot, a little east coast versus west coast IPA. Let's talk about apricot beers for a minute just as we get into the uh, Okanagan, or, or pardon me, the cannery Okanagan Days, which is an apricot and pinot gris American wheat ale. We have some fun things to talk about with this, so let's talk about a little history on apricot beers in general. So, in about 1994-95, all of the interesting, innovative brewing was happening on the West Coast. You know, we're going to get into it a little bit when we talk about the West Coast IPAs. We'll talk about about um, Anchor Brewing in Sierra Nevada and Russian River Br uh, and Blind Pig. And we'll talk about a lot of what was happening on the West Coast, but they've always been a few years ahead of the East. And one of the beers that came out was out of Seattle, Pyramid Brewing, which for a brief period was actually sold in Alberta um, before we got really into brewing here and we were still importing out of the U.S. Um, they, in 1994, came out with apricot, uh, apricot wheat ale, just Pyramid Apricot Wheat. Didn't have a fun name or anything, but that was kind of the start of these American apricot ales, if you want to use it as a term. There isn't a ton of precedent for apricot being used in European brewing. Again, it's a not terribly common fruit. Uh, in 1999, of course, we had Cantillon Fufun come out, which is an incredibly collectible, hard to get lambic. Uh, bottle on eBay these days will set you back about $75, $80. But let's circle back here. So, 1994, Pyramid Brewing is brewing an apricot wheat ale. Well, what happened in 95? And this is an Alberta connection that I find very interesting. In 1995, Alley Cat opened, and as one of their very, very first beers, they opened with Apricot, which was an apricot wheat. Was it a clone brew of Pyramid's apricot wheat? Probably a little, but you know what? It's kind of nice that we had an Albertan brewery jumping into this so early. Um, the reason I'm kind of getting so much into the history is that apricot beers, you know, apart from basically Apricot, disappeared. And, I mean, really disappeared. We had raspberry beers. We have the absolute dominance of uh, Fernie's What the Huck Huckleberry Ale in the market. We have so many different flavors. Like, it was the summer of guava. We're coming into kind of pineapple season again. Like, it's... Apricot was one of the very, very first fruit beers that really captured the, co the general public's interest and kind of took it from there. So... This is an American wheat ale. Now, American wheat ales are inspired more by German Hefeweizen than they are Belgian wit. Uh, but German Hefeweizen, of course, has that kind of banana, clovey, um, coriander sort of character to them. Uh, American wheats don't. They, they keep the, you know, wheat base, which adds that kind of flowery, tart uh, character to the beers. But it doesn't have that very characteristic German yeast, that Bavarian yeast. So that's your base beer, and to that they're adding apricots, and then because it is the Okanagan, and if you've ever been to Naramata, that's kind of the, the core of the BC wine industry is the Naramata bench. It's a perfect amphitheater for growing wines, especially white wines. Um, if we're talking about micro appellations in BC, I'd probably call the Naramata bench the best place in BC to grow wine. Don't have a lot of familiarity with Ontario, but let's just pretend that's not that good, because out here we don't see that much of it. It could be the best microclimate for making wine in Canada. And there's a brewery right in the middle of it, Cannery Brewing. Uh, I actually got to have my first pint of Cannery Brewing when I was in the Okanagan. A little tiny roadhouse across the street from the hotel we were staying in. And it was the Naramata Nut Brown Ale. It was absolutely delicious. And Julie, who is way cooler than I am. Uh, I used to go to Zwanzi Day at Bar Volo in Toronto. That sounds amazing. Um, there was actually a chance we were going to get a Zwanzi Day here based in Calgary, but it kind of came to nothing, and I don't know exactly why. So here we have a very bright, fresh, clean American wheat ale. And then we add Pinot Gris juice, and we add apricots. The apricots right on top, I get apricots right away. A lot of stone fruit here. Did I say anything particular about how it's made? No, wow. You know, considering just how busy and how much is going on in this label, there is an absolutely shocking lack of information. I mean, yes, Canadian wheat ale fermented with apricots and peanut gris juice. Thank you, yes, I get that. But 
No, there's a very tiny amount of information on that. That's interesting. Yeah, crushable. And yeah, Chad, the, the term we use, at least in wine side, when it's it's sweet but dry, we call it fruity. Like it's got a lot of upfront approachable, easy to like, kind of mouth filling sweetness. But after you swallow, your mouth's not picking up any perceptible sweetness. We call that a fruity sort of thing. And, you know, I think if you say, hey, this fruit beer is kind of fruity, that might be just a tad redundant. But yes, it does kind of follow with that. One thing I'm surprised at is just how much that American wheat style actually translates through this. I mean, yes, I get the apricots. Yes, I get the... Yeah, you know, I was about to say I get the Pinot Gris. Does anybody get like a distinct like white grape or wine note out of this? Yeah. You do? Aaron does? Very, like, at the back. You get it up here at the back of your teeth? I don't, but I'm going to retaste. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's more textural than it is anything else. Did you just have your own hashtag mouthfeel moment, Aaron? Well done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, debatable whether we get a lot of wine character out of this. But one thing I do get is, especially on the nose, I get the fresh crushed wheat. I get this. Uh, if you've ever been to a brewery or ever home brewed, freshly crushed barley and freshly crushed wheat has a really distinctive smell. Uh, and this has this has that aroma of, of being freshly mashed in or maybe just freshly ground uh, malt. And I absolutely love that. Like, it's a beer that, you know, it's advertising the apricots and pinot gris, but underneath, this is one hell of a wheat beer. It's quite good. It's subtle, it's crushable, but I gotta say, for what is a beer that they probably are selling with the idea that you're gonna sit down and, you know, crush a four pack while you're fishing or kneeboarding or I don't know what people do in the Okanagan, grossly overprice their wines. That's probably what it's for. Um, but no, that's, um, that's got a lot going on, more than I expected, honestly. Uh, personal, as I mentioned, you know, one of the very first craft breweries, if not the very first craft brewery I ever uh, had a real like connection to was Cannery. Um, they've been through the store for ages. We carried the Blackberry Porter and the Anacrist Amber and the Narramatta Nut Brown for about 15 years straight in uh, the 650 mil glass bombers. You know, back when people used to still buy the 650 mil glass bombers and they weren't just decorative. Um, but yeah, they're, they're a really good brewery, and I'm really happy to see them doing things like this, because that's really, really good brewing. Is there pre-BC historical precedent for adding fruit to wheat beer? Um, yeah, that's what I was trying to get to when I was talking about Pyramid Brewing uh, in Seattle, Washington in 1994. Probably the first... Okay. Pre-1994, what was a fruit beer? It was like Zima. It was beer trying to advertised to women or being a lifestyle beverage or whatever um, not realizing that apparently if you wanted to advertise to women you had to make a really really tight well prepared kettle sour and add really cool fruit to it um, but no fruit beer kind of got this bad name because the only imported fruit beers were the heavily sweetened Lindemann's Lambics uh, and the kind of North American styles like it was really like Zima and things like that it was it was slim pickings. The idea of like, you know, Ferny What the Huck, where you can get it basically anywhere. I can go to my local gas station and get a pint of What the Huck. I mean, it's just everywhere. Uh, and before that, it was Wild Rose Raspberry. The idea of fruit beer being like a thing really does start with Pyramid's Apricot Wheat in 1994, and then locally with uh, Alley Cat's Apricot here in Alberta. But we have spent enough time on that. It's a head to head, so we know what this tastes like. Let's try the next competitor up. The second one. No, it's ask. I'm wondering if you can. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so Aaron is trying an experiment. He is playing a little bit of music in the background. Uh, his questions are, first off, can anyone hear it? Is it loud enough? Is it distracting? Or can nobody hear it? Or does nobody care? Does it matter? Yeah. Does it in any way matter to you? Okay. Let's jump into the Snake Lake, not as I keep calling it sun-drenched, because honestly that's better. Uh, this is the sun-soaked Tart Apricot New England Pale Ale. 
Yeah. Um, sun-soaked tart, not sun-drenched tart. Mine's better, but that's fine. That's what they put on the can. Uh, now, these guys did actually put a little bit of information for us, although most of it's just woo. It doesn't get much better than the late summer sunlight flickering through the boring. It doesn't tell us anything about the beer. Who cares? Um, so this is a New England pale ale uh, with apricots added. Now, we've had quite a few fruited New England pails. We even had last week. During Guava Week, we, of course, had the very excellent Cabin Pink Popper, uh, which was, of course, a New England pail with guava added. Would have been very unusual if we had a cherry beer during Guava Week, of course. I remember Brewster's on Mayor McGrath. I'll, I'll just leave out the second line. I remember Brewster's on Mayor McGrath. I remember when Brewster's brewed beer on Mayor McGrath before they took it all up to the central facility. Uh, and they actually made beer here. And they had an actual functional brewery that wasn't just for display. And then I remember the worst years where they were brewing everything in a central location in Calgary and shipping it down here. And the food kind of went downhill. And they weren't brewing. The brewery was just polished once a week to make it look nice. Um, and then it became the tank house which is exactly like Brewster's but without the license and it kind of struggled along for a couple more years and the tap list went really downhill which considering it started out as a Brewster's which isn't really known for its tap list that had to be bloody hard to do is to take it downhill from there oh I like this um, oh the apricots come through more than I thought with this uh, alcohol is 5.5 which is either the same or slightly higher than this Five flat, okay. Um, when I'm checking alcohol in this, it's not like, whoo-hoo, going to get ripped up tonight. Um, fun thing about alcohol, this is something we've covered a surprising amount on the wine tasting. Is I don't think it's something I've brought up on the beer tastings. Alcohol in a fermented spirit has a really, really unique trick. Alcohol will actually make whatever you're drinking taste fruitier, taste richer, taste more expensive, taste more luxurious, it seems more viscous. Right up to the point where your tongue says, wait a minute, that's alcohol, at which point like the emperor has no clothes and everything tastes super astringent. So just that extra, you know, half a percent alcohol in this, it's weightier, it's richer, it feels more luxurious, and to a certain point it feels more expensive uh, just because of that extra little tiny kick of alcohol. Just running through the comments here real quick. Don't get white grape. I don't either. Uh, can't hear anything on the music. Didn't know there was music. It's there. Doesn't matter. Thank you. Aaron appreciates those comments more than I do. It says on the can that it's soured. All right, Eric. Well done. I didn't know that. I, I was distracted by the little paragraph on the back, which I will admit... Not desperately helpful in the fact that it doesn't say that it's been soured. It's on a different thing on the side. Now, I'm giving them a little bit of a hard time. You know, you all know that I love Snake Lake. We had Adam on here a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, less, less poetry on the back, lads. More actual useful information about the beer. Late 2010s. I remember the five cent wings at Brewster's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is unreal. And I, yeah, Jeff and Darren, um, Jeff's the manager of OJ's West, and Darren's kind of the Southern Alberta manager for the OJ's group. They have a really amazing relationship with Snake Lake. Um, and yeah, they, they have things that I think they have a unique, like, one off beer that's just being brewed for them by Snake Lake right now. Uh, and the, um, what was it called? The Brighter Horizons originally was supposed to be an exclusive for OJs, and then we ended up getting it. We're getting off track. We're getting very tangenty again. Five cent wings at Brewster's. Oh man, can you imagine five cent wings? You're lucky if you get them a bloody 25 cents these days. Yeah, the other pale ale, that was the, uh, the Brighter Horizons, which was a lightly fruited pale ale as well. I don't think it was soured. Uh, but then I didn't know this was soured. Um, and I actually, that doesn't have a shell spot right this second. Uh, and it's not because there's anything wrong with the beer. We've actually hit a little bit of a 
m bit of a space crisis. Uh, the the beer, the new seasonals are literally coming faster than we can sell them as cold weather comes on. You know, when it was 31, 32 every day in July, no problem. We always had gaps. Hey, Cam wants to come out with four new beers this week? Cool, we can fit those right in. As things kind of cool off and people move to spirits or they move to wine or they move to something else or maybe they're just drinking less because they have to help their kids in school or what have you, um, we're actually fighting space a little bit right now, which is not something we've had to do up until this point. So that's been interesting. You know, me and Sour IPAs, the very, very first Sour IPA I ever had uh, was by Ithaca Brewing. And I traded a guy, I used to do a lot of beer trading uh, on Rate Beer way, way back in the day. Uh, sent some wildly illegal packages across the border. Uh, we're not filming, right? Um, but I had the Ithaca Super Friend Sour IPA, and it was, well, I'll be very honest, I didn't like it at the time. Uh, and now soured IPAs are kind of becoming a thing. I, and again, what's the difference between a sour IPA and a heavily hopped kettle sour? Nothing but what you put on the label. Uh, but yeah, I, I really, really like this. You'd assume they were drinking more, helping kids in school. That's probably fair. Mm. I will say, there's a thing I miss with the cannery here, and that's that really excellent, like, fresh crushed wheat, fresh crushed barley sort of aroma. Don't get me wrong, this is brilliant. I get, I get the apricot, it melds with all the tropical fruit from the hazy pale ale style. This suits an apricot very, very well. I kind of, but underneath, I don't know. Can't really taste the malt bill, can you? Not that there's anything wrong with that. The Mary McGrath Drive expansion is what held closers. What is with Lethbridge being like the expansion location that brings down a chain? Like, you know, Rick's Grill came here, and they opened the water tower, and then they were gone. Um, Brewster's was doing great, opened down here, and it was just like, oh, God, Brewster's is done. It's like Lethbridge is the poison pill yeah. for any restaurant chain. It's like, we're doing great, and then they expanded to Lethbridge, and then a year later, everything's dead. If you can make it in Lethbridge, you can make it anywhere. Yeah, if you can make it in Lethbridge, you can make it anywhere. Actually, right? So I was saying earlier that I couldn't really get any of the malt bill. Right at the very, very, very top of the glass, like almost out of it, I'm getting some really nice, pretty cereal grain. But I've been actively looking for it for the last two minutes, too. Uh, the Skyrocket 3 is here. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I had a beer and a pizza they bought. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, I had a beer and a pizza at Establishment Brewing a couple of Saturdays ago. Uh, and they are switching out of Skyrocket 5 back to Skyrocket 3. Uh, we have a little tiny bit of Skyrocket 5 left on the shelf. I think the front four or five four packs are still Skyrocket 5 and then everything behind them is Skyrocket 3 again. So different hop bill, different everything. But if you do want Skyrocket 3, if you don't want five, I'm going to sell it to the five first. It has to be the front spots. Uh, but if you really want a three, either reach further in the fridge or just ask. We do have plenty of three. I just want to get out of five first. Yes, Craig, there is Skyrocket. Uh, we did sell it out of Skyrocket, Afternoon Delight, and uh, Jam Rock last week on Thursday, Friday. Uh, they were all back on the shelves Sunday morning this week. So they are all back. So let us set aside the apricot for the moment. Uh, I'm actually going to get into shameless plug portion just one beer early. Because they're kind of in match pairs, I don't want to interrupt talking about East Coast versus West Coast to get into that. So let's talk about what we have coming up in the next couple of days. So... If you've ever wondered, oh, I, I love the beer tasting because it's such good value, um, but I don't like doing the wine tasting because it's so expensive. I literally think I'm making more money on this week's beer tasting than this week's wine tasting. 
This week's wine tasting is basically being done at cost at $85. Uh, it is the wines of Franz Weniger, uh, two from his Hungarian portfolio, one from his Austrian portfolio, uh, and one from his experimental line. So we have three reds and a rosé, because I wasn't expecting mid-October to be this bloody warm. I was expecting it to be colder and we'd be doing what? red wines, but that aside. It's going to be a fantastic tasting. You're getting the wines at cost. We're going to be joined by Eric Mercier of Juice Imports, who is going to be, you know, his usual charming, amazing self. You've seen him before if you've been to some of our previous tastings. And then beside that, there's still a chance. We don't know. We're not going to guarantee it. Um, but Franz Weniger himself of Weniger, like the guy, actually expressed an interest in doing this with us. It will be two in the morning uh, in Austria for him. Um, but he said maybe. And uh, I'm going to keep saying maybe right up until the point he says no. And the more times we mention it, the more peer pressure he's going to feel to do it. I strongly doubt he's watching this video, but if he is, now he feels more peer pressure. Uh, for beer tasting next week, uh, we are going to jump into something really exceptional. We are going to go Germany. You know, I, I was going to do an Oktoberfest theme. And then I realized this is going to be just like the All the Things Stout. Because if there's anything I hate in beer, I was going to say more than that All the Things Stout, but there's nothing I hate more than that All the Things Stout. Um, I really hate Oktoberfest style beer. I don't think they taste like anything. Um, I think they're watered down Munich Hellas with no body that are, you know, 4% alcohol sold in giant liter steins to tourists. I don't think Oktoberfest is a desperately interesting beer because it's literally a watery, more watery example of a good Munich Helles. So I'd rather do a Helles. So we are going to do two from Alberta, two from Germany. Uh, we are going to do the Annex Ship Shape Munich Dunkel. And then, of course, the two classic Bavarian styles are, of course, uh, Dunkel and Hefeweizen, one from Canada, one from Germany. Uh, and then the Munich Helles from Establishment. If you haven't had Mellow Gold yet, oh, you're in for such a treat. It tastes like the world's greatest Ritz crackers, and I mean that in the best possible way. And then we have the uh, the Keller beer. Not a, pardon me, not a style we see a great deal of, but a style I really, really like. If you want to think of this as kind of pre-1900 Germany's answer to IPA, well, you'd be very, very wrong, but you wouldn't be that far off. So some really interesting things coming up for upcoming beer tasting. Let's just quickly, oh wow, the comments are going a little madness. Uh, Social candy is really good. Nice, and Sean, we will save you a wine tasting. I hope that's what you're talking about. Uh, okay, so let's get into East Coast versus West Coast. This is by OT Brewing. This is their Rivals series. Uh, I hope this series continues because I think it's awesome. Um, so they have an East Coast IPA versus a West Coast IPA. Uh, West Coast, of course, is older than East Coast. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's talk briefly about the history of IPA a little bit here. Uh, We've covered this a few times. I'm gonna keep it reasonably short because we are on beer tasting number 25. Um, and you all don't wanna hear this story in its full length again. Starting about 1975, we have Fritz Maytag, heir to the Maytag Appliances Fortune. He buys the Anchor Brewing Company in San Francisco. He is really enamored with these old school English beers. And he comes out with a beer called Liberty Ale. He uses an almost forgotten process called dry hopping, where you add hops to the beer after the beer is already boiled. Liberty Ale is considered by most to be so hoppy you can't drink it, but it becomes beloved by a small set, including uh, the gentleman who started Sierra Nevada Brewing. He opens that in 1980. He brews what is considered then to be the hoppiest beer ever made in Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, which at this point I could drink like Bud Light. Um, and that kind of kicks it off. We have Vinny Trilerzo in 1994. He gets started with Blind Pig Brewing and, of course, goes on to open uh, Russian River Brewing. We have Stone. We have uh, Pike's Place Brewing was really, really early in Seattle. Uh, we have Alesmith, of course. Like, it, it just it snowballs from there. And we end up with this California Super Bitter West Coast IPA. But like I said at the very beginning, 
The West Coast always, well, I was going to say five years, but in this case, about 25 years uh, ahead of the East Coast. But in about 2010, uh, Brewery called The Alchemist. Uh, and I actually was lucky enough to trade back when I was still beer trading on right beer. I was actually able to trade for a can of the Heady Topper Alchemist, New England IPA. Now, they were a really tiny brewery, and this was at absolute like peak hype. And I want to talk a little bit, this is something I've covered before, but in about 2010, 2015 era, the entire beer zeitgeist was rightly or wrongly based around two websites, Beer Advocate and Rape Beer. They're basically Yelp for beer. You are allowed to give it a one to five star rating. You could, and with you know tens of points, uh, and you could leave either nothing or a full review. And these beer websites created immediate hype. If something you know popped up on and everybody started giving it you know high fours into five, it would become the most desirable, crazy. Um, search for like you'd go to the trading forum and it'd just be everyone is looking for this beer. Hetty Topper was like that. Hetty Topper really got huge. And this was when East Coast IPAs were having a moment. Now we've always had Dogfish Head and Sam Calgione uh, who's made some incredible IPAs with his 60 and 90 minute IPAs. Those are spot on. But there never really been a definable difference. These were just West Coast IPAs brewed on the East Coast. Where that changed was with Alchemist Hetty Topper and with uh, Sean Hill at Hill Farmstead Brewing in Vermont. Uh, so this style, the East Coast style, far younger than West Coast IPA. Aaron's giggling like he got away with something here. Also, you left the front door open. <laughs> <laughs> the door is very much supposed to be locked, but Aaron's going to do his best to run the cash register despite no training no, on I it can't whatsoever. Do that. I got to take the beer tasting. You got to go do the cash register. You're going to take this yeah, on. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to take the beer tasting on. Okay, so I we've had no a idea. <laughs> So, we've had a fun situation. Uh, so someone, probably Aaron, left the front door unlocked despite us being closed. Nigel. It was Aaron. Um, but uh, I have to go run the cash register. This has never happened before. So I am going to go and run the cash register. Aaron, do you need a mic or have you got uh, you something know, up? I'll just, uh, I don't have a glass of it yet, so let me just pour myself on here if you don't mind. Let's point this mic. I'm just gonna talk about whatever it is. You know what I'll talk about is Ryan Dick. That's what we're listening to that no one can hear. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, I'm gonna change the camera here, folks. Here we are. Oh, that's my face mask. Here we are, Aaron. There we go. Oh, no, you can't see me yet. There we go. Excellent. Hello. 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 Okay. Now it's, uh, now we're, now we're making, uh, movies. Um, so I have a, uh, I don't know, I don't even remember what Kyle was talking about, but, um, East Coast IPA, huh? Yeah, well, I'm kind of like I don't know much about IPAs. Um, either the <laughs> either than <laughs> either than the fact that you know they are um, kind of ridiculed among uh, many um, many crowds. I don't know. I feel like they kind of had a bit of a, a recent rise uh, to stardom and uh, graceful. Maybe not fall. No, that's not true. Like I mean, I think among the people who like talk about beer, they're. Uh, you know, a very important installation in, um, you know, anyone, anyone who's tasting beer, they always kind of want to know what's going on in this world. That's important to me. And I don't actually know shit about beer. You know, um, I like beer because, uh, you know, I like beer because, you know, I think that the elements that go into like creating something, it's chemistry, it's all these things, that stuff is really like important to me. And I like how you can change those subtle details to, uh, you know, make uh, something that's like pretty exquisite. I haven't even tasted this yet. I'm just kind of like laying out a bit of a resume, which is literally nothing aside from like drinking uh, with Kyle occasionally. So um, anyway, I was on radio for a little while. That's what, that was my job for, uh, you know, before I ran things like this. So I do have uh, a gift of being able to bring literally zero content to the table and make it sound like I've been talking for at least five minutes straight. Here's Kyle with the weather. <laughs> Why wow, you didn't sound nervous at all. 
<laughs> you definitely didn't go on a complete ramble that made no sense whatsoever. You did great, Aaron. Proud of you, buddy. All right, so that was uh, that was why we locked the front door, Nigel. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that was something that I, I feel really bad for the guy. He was out of town. He's like, what's going on? Well, it would take longer to explain than I have time for because I could hear di Aaron dying in here. So, uh, yeah, let's... <laughs> wow, we're derailed. Okay, East Coast IPA. Um, lots of proteins left in the beer. Um, much more emphasis on dry hopping, late hop additions to minimize bitterness. Lots more of the tropical fruit. Less of your kind of classic varieties of hops like Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook. The classic 3C IPA. Um, I almost finished that off. You might have been slightly nervous there, Aaron. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so this is... Wow, I can't believe I picked that up that well after that. Uh, so this is the new school of IPA. If you came into the store in like, let's say the last 18 months and you were freshly 18 and you were really excited about IPA because maybe you just had no social life, um, this would be the style of IPA that you were very used to uh, versus those of us who grew up drinking Tree Hophead because it was the only IPA in the whole damn province that wasn't super expired when it showed up on liquor store shelves, even if you ran that liquor store. Aaron is not the hand. No, nope, Aaron is not the hand. That is absolutely not true. Aaron occasionally will reach in for a beer, but he is not the hand. Yes, Aaron is a hand. Exactly. Oops. There you go. <laughs> oh, wow. The comments. The comments are just amazing. Uh, but yes. Okay. Yeah, that was fun. So this is our East Coast IPA. This is by OT Brewing out of Calgary in the rival series of the East Coast style. Salty. Is there some salinity? So I, I will say these are quite fresh. These showed up last week. Salty. Like real black licorice, like way back in the back of your mouth, like that salty ass like black licorice flavor. So you're getting big salt, big black licorice. Like not black licorice like apparent. It's like back there somewhere. Hmm. An afterthought, kind of. Well, I'll be honest. Um, OT Brewing, I think I agree with Aaron. This actually has a little more bitterness than what I would consider like a classic New England IPA would have. Let's have this again, right against the sun soaked apricot, which is very New England style. I think that despite the fact that A, it's sour, and B, it has apricots in it. I think that kind of captures the East Coast style a little bit better. That's not a bad IPA, but I would say rather than being purely East Coast, I'd say that sits more on the fence with like the 88 wave pool, which is neither. It takes some notes from the West Coast, it takes notes in the East Coast, and it's kind of a no coast IPA, which is kind of interesting. Or both coasts, I suppose, but no coast sounds cooler because we're in Alberta and we don't have a coast. No, no, Aaron, finish that thought. Hotel, never mind. Okay. Yes to the black licorice. Oh, yeah, sweet, right? Yeah. Mary the bus goes to knock our socks off. Um, I will say, uh, OT Brewing recently had a changeover in their head brewer. Their former head brewer went over to start Tail Gunner Brewing, uh, who makes an amazing Czech pill that at some point will be showing up on the channel. I absolutely guarantee it. I adore that beer. Uh, they're the only people like in Alberta who are actually doing the proper step mashing method of making a pills where you start with a fairly cool mash, you take a third away, you boil that, and then you add that back to raise the temperature of the mash, and you take some more out, boil that, add it back, rather than, you know, being like a normal person, not a crazy person, you know, increasing the heat as you can with modern brewing equipment. Now they do it the super old fashioned way, uh, which I really respect and I think makes a better Pilsner, uh, or at least it makes a better story. So we will be featuring that at some point. Uh, that said, uh, the OT Brewing, like, I absolutely adore their American Mild. The 500 and Double 500. Why isn't this just 500? 500 is better than this. And it's, you know, I'm, I try not to shit talk anything unless it shows up like all the things on the channel. But honestly, OT, 
I'm a bit disappointed in you. You can make an excellent East Coast IPA. 500 is an excellent, excellent East Coast IPA that doesn't get enough love. This is really kind of not my favorite thing. Mm. A bit disappointed. All right, let's jump into the West Coast. Now, West Coast IPAs, we've covered the history a little bit. Um, these tend to be the IPAs that were really around up until about three, four years ago. Uh, that New England style took a bit to get A, big in the US, uh, outside the Northeast, and then B, to kind of make its way up to Canada a year later. The first thing you'll notice is that this is A, clear, and B, significantly darker. Now, that darkness is important because an IPA is all about that was gross. All a balance between bitterness and sweetness. This is just one of the record books, Aaron. Yeah, more for the blooper reel. Uh, for those of you who can't hear, Aaron's absolutely dying over there. Um, so with an East Coast IPA, we have a relatively light amount of bitterness, so the beer can be a lot paler. So we have a lot of perceptible hop aroma and hop flavor, but because it's predominantly done through dry hopping, there isn't a lot of perceptible bitterness, so we don't need much sweetness. With West Coast IPA, the hops are boiled rather than dry hopped, uh, and as a result, you end up with a lot more bitterness. Your alpha humulin and alpha acid levels can actually be two to three times what they are in an actual East Coast. Do they give us IBUs on either of these? No. Actually, I think it's broadly the same information on the back. They're like 60s. Okay. Um, I'm guessing. You want me to look it up? I'll yeah, look Chad, I, I, I don't want to put it that aggressively, but yes, I, I don't think that that's a great East Coast IPA. Let's try the West Coast here. So, West Coast have a lot more bitterness because the hops are boiled rather than dry hopped. As a result, the beer requires sweetness, and this darker color is through the addition of caramelized or crystal uh, barley or crystal malt and that actually adds more sweetness to the beer to counteract the bitterness because caramelized sugars don't ferment. They just remain in the beer and add sweetness. Apparently they are 40 versus 70 IBUs. That would check out. That does tend to be um, broadly the same. Redemption, this is better. Yes, it is. This is very much that classic 3C West Coast IPA. I'll guarantee this has tons of Cascade in it. Um, and I will say, the reason that Cascade is so omnipresent... So, when Sierra Nevada Pale Ale was kind of coming along in, you know, 1980-81, that was about the year that Cascade as a hop variety was actually developed. Uh, so, since basically every West Coast IPA owes its roots to Sierra Nevada Pale. And I know the stories about, oh, in Victorian England, there were these boats and you needed to go to India. Rubbish. It is abs a, it's barely historically true, and B, uh, that would have been wildly bitter, and then it was actually more brewed as a concentrate designed to be cut down when it got to India. There is no, the name carried nothing, there's no brewing connection to the English beers. So that's why I don't mention them generally. But let's cut back to Sierra Nevada here. This is a West Coast IPA in the model of the original Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, which came out when Cascade as a hop came out. And as a result, they wanted to use this new all-American hop that was called Cascade. And because they used it so heavily and because it was so distinctive in their beer, Cascade has remained to a certain point, although these days it's really being overtaken by Amarillo and Citra, which I will admit are better hops, but they don't have the history, damn it. Um, that's why every West Coast IPA, perhaps that you've ever had, has had some Cascade in it, is because, you know, that's the people who started it. Why not dry hop this one to bring out the hop flavor? Um, I would guess to exaggerate the differences between the traditional East versus West Coast styles. Um, I would suggest that if they really wanted to do that, I would have brought the bitterness on this up a bit and just made this a can of five handy. Um, but I think that the choice not to dry hop this uh, would be deliberate in the sense, not that dry hopping was unusual on the West Coast at all. That goes right back to Anchor Liberty, which is like the proto beer for all of this. But 
dry hopping as a rule is so absolutely critical. How about this? It's so critically important to East Coast IPAs. Without dry hopping, East Coast IPA doesn't exist. You can make a damn fine West Coast IPA without hopping or dry hopping. You literally can't make an IPA without hops. Uh, you can make a really good West Coast IPA without dry hopping. It would be difficult. Your brewing would have to be perfect, but you could make an exceptionally good drinkable, maybe not world class, but damn drinkable West Coast IPA with no dry hopping. You literally cannot make East Coast IPAs without dry hops. About the art for a second, Eric will appreciate this. Sure. Um, manga, obviously, like Astro Boy, like we're. Well, we get. Are you on voice? No, no, no. But so we want to talk about. I'll zoom in a little bit. Aaron wants us to talk about this a little bit, and I'm not it's the person to talk about like, it. It is ridiculous. I quite like it. Well, let's put them in the right order. So they're. I mean, they're. They're headed right after in a very kind of Japanese anime style. Yeah. It's very. You know, I love the packaging. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I love the idea because we're all talking right now about East Coast versus West Coast IPA. We're talking about this idea of, well, East Coast IPAs had its real moan in the sun, but people are starting to slide back to the West Coast a little bit. I love that they kind of said, okay, well, let's test that market. Who likes this better? Who likes this better? Well, I like this better because. 500 is great. I don't know what happened here. Uh, and this is like a really solid West Coast IPA. This reminds me a lot of Tree Hophead. This reminds me very much of um, not so much Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, but Sierra Nevada Torpedo, which was there. Once Sierra Nevada Pale Ale started to, you know, hardcore like hoppy IPA drinkers started to become a little too soft. Uh, they launched Torpedo IPA, which was like everyone else's IPA, but way more bitter and way more hoppy. And they kind of clawed some of that market share back. Yes, exactly. Late hop additions uh, for West Coast. You can get some great flavor without dry hopping. So yes, you can get your five minute, one minute knockout hop additions. You, you know, add it to the, the boiling um, Word, and then you just turn the heat off and just let it go, let it cool off. There are some really, really pretty ways to do that. Uh, Craig, a proto or historical beer tasting? I mean, you'd have to have Anchor Steam or Anchor Liberty, uh, which is annoying because Anchor is really, really hard to get right now. Uh, my brain is telling me that Sleeman's bought the right to Anchor and then hasn't imported any. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's you that was the best one you dick um, uh, there's still some there okay fine um, <laughs> if anyone's curious about my rankings uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> you read like a book um, proto beer so what would that look like so you'd have to have something like your proto apricot beer well let's let's say we can't get pyramid apricot we, we do apricot your proto brown ale would almost have to be Big Rock Traditional, which I have no problem with. I still like Trad, and I will have it on tap occasionally. Huh. You'd have to have tree... Uh, okay, let's walk this back. Let's say we're not going to do the very first progenitors for the style, because that would be very difficult to do. Let's just say these are the first beers you might have had in Alberta. If yeah, you were like a diehard craft beer drinker in 1997... Seven. We should do 1997. You poor fucking human being. <laughs> Trying to drink craft beer in 1997 in Alberta would be painful. Yeah. God, I can't imagine. Well, um, it be? It'd be, well, it'd be Tree it'd Hophead would be the only IPA, and I'm reaching there. I'm not sure yeah. Tree was open in 97. Yeah. We might Is have Alley to just... Alley Cat opened in 95. Big Rock actually opened shockingly or like 86 or 85. Right. Um, beyond that, craft beer in this province? I mean... Yeah. It's pre Half Pints, which was the first craft brewery in Man Manitoba. Oh, Brew Brothers, they came somewhere in there. Were they Brew Brothers came later? somewhere in there. That's true, but yeah, this is even pre Village. Like, they were, they were tough old times. I mean, yeesh. Um, we were just talking about the. just like mention this like if you're the one who's phony and just letting it ring forever uh, i'm not <laughs> going to answer as funny as that would be no it's not me it could be any one of these jokers though scotty really you don't like fat tug you don't like uh, you need to try it again though fat tug is a classic and you should try it again Oh God, Drummond! Uh, how could I forget about Drummond, the very first bucket beer brewery in Alberta? Let's just make everything and make it terribly, but put this really cool Pegasus on the label, and that's what we'll do. Oh man, Drummond Brewing. 
That was a that was a thing. Eric's comment is interesting, and if you think about the way Collective Arts does it versus OT, that's um, an excellent point. Yeah, Eric, I was going to get to your comment in a minute, but you're right. There's no artist credit here whatsoever. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. Even if it's in house. Yeah, even if it's in house, they should still be credit because this is great art. Yeah. They should be crediting someone. You're right. Collective Arts, Aaron, is a great example where they credit the artist for everything. Yeah. Big Rock, Alley Cat, Wild Rose. There you go, Wild Rose. You people really hate me, because uh, I have to drink all those. <laughs> Sorry, that's me. I think um, it'd be great. I think it'd be that's great, fun. too. The, the 1997... You got a dress. We'll very go, 90s. Yeah, we're going to find you something straight out of 1997. And um, there'll be like a... I don't know, we'll find the sitcom that was hot at the time. Apparently, Aaron wants to do a 90s time warp tasting. The 1997 Canada Alberta craft beer scene. Seeing what people think of that. Anybody else here on for the I dress like it's the 90s, we do a 90s beer week? Please say no. If, if you love me, you'll say no. Aaron's off answering that phone that will absolutely not shut up. Oh, I know. No, I know it's funny. I just don't really particularly want to do it. Um, any questions about the beers tonight? Because uh, we've gotten through this in a reasonable amount of time. We're 50-ish minutes in. I think we've covered a lot of ground. And yeah, we will... If I dress 90s or not, be prepared for not, um, we will do something in a... Beers you could get in 1997 in Alberta. Now again, they won't obviously be in the same form because it's been 23 years. And I guarantee you trad has changed quite substantially because uh, you have to do trad because it's the I won't do grass because grass is shit but trad has changed a lot wow so wild rose alley cat this is going to take a lot of research on my part, part and I'm not saying that as a bad thing I'm actually really looking forward to this what was available in 1997 in Alberta from these breweries that they'd still stand behind today that'd be really interesting and Big Rock is coming out with a retro pack. Wait a minute. Did Justin suggest this early tasting? And No, I know. You didn't. How about getting casks? Um, we are in a cask beer wasteland. Um, the reason for that is, I think, venue limits. Um, there's, there's not really anyone in town who's really into doing cask nights and I know Cooley tried doing them on a weekly basis or monthly basis for a while I've seen Kingsman do them I think Telegraph has done them um, but I don't know why we don't really have more cask nights other than the fact that I don't think they've been desperately successful anywhere else we have such amazing breweries I would love to have Skyrocket with peaches or you know uh, super saturation but with hops in the cask I'd love to see something like that now, while bars are still at 50% capacity, I think that might be the wrong time for that. But I do really love cask nights, and I would love to see that come back. Kyle with the soul patch, that's not happening. Oh man, did Drummond actually bribe people with a $2 bill in each case? I feel like these days that would be against the liquor laws. Two, one, three, four. Uh, 2143, 2134. I'm loving seeing how much love for Cannery, which is not a brewery we work with all that often. I'm loving seeing the love for that. One and two. Fernie would make one and four. Fernie, I will say, Fernie's done some exceptional work. We have. I'm about to make a lot of people very upset with me. Um, the, uh,. I, Aaron's laughing with a childish glee at all of your suggestions, so right you destroyed me. You ruined me, all of you. Um, yeah, Scotty, I'm kind of in with you. 214 and then, you know, getting run over by a tractor and then 3. Yeah. You know what? I really respect OT. I was really excited for this. I kind of feel like they've let the side down. I don't... I don't know what to say about that East Coast IPA. They make a great East Coast IPA. We've done... I'm pretty sure we've done 500. We've definitely done double 500. They're both excellent beers. I really don't know what's happened here. You didn't like those at all? Either? 
the, the, the West Coast okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not exciting. There were, during the height of West Coast, there were lots prettier West Coast IPAs. I did. No, this oh, this was right, the yeah. yeah that, that's the actual order. I like this. First time we've had a hands down winner. Yeah, you're right. But it kind of earned it this week. That's even if I didn't know it was sour, and even if I made fun of the poetry on the back, um, I kind of I kind of think that's really respectable. That's a really really good beer. Well done, Snake Lake. That's that's a very respectable beer. Good brewery. Yeah. Good brewery. Good beer. Yeah. And, and nice people. Adam's been nothing but a friend to us. It'd be nice to have them on again. Um, can you tell the folks what we've been listening to the whole time? They can't hear it, but I drew a picture. See what I drew? <laughs> okay, yep. So Aaron's very, very proud. The uh, so this yep. is what we have been listening Up to. A Up a bit? Yeah. Okay. Uh, right there. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Get to Know Lonesome by Skinny Dick. Uh, just came out, and it's uh, really good. You should go over to the Bandcamp page if you can. Eric said that the, his copy just came in. I'm sure he can vouch for the fact that it is a uh, probably the best country album to come out of um, southern Alberta this far anyway uh, in forever. So that's nice. Where the hell is Moose Jaw? That's all. That's all? Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that moment. And if you love Aaron's artistic direction with our channel, and how could you not, he was also very heavily involved in that project because why would you hire anyone but Aaron? <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> Thank you. You're That's welcome. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Has anyone had the other two in the Rival Series? I didn't know there were two more in the Rival Series. So, no, I have not. Um, well, we pick whatever beer you make fun of. Uh, well, <laughs> you know... I do endeavor to be very honest on this, and I don't ever want to say anything bad about a brewery that I respect or about people that, you know, really do hold my meal ticket in their hand, because if I absolutely rip something establishment over the coals uh, and then they cut me off, well, that's, that's a huge deal to the store. But I also really do want to be honest, um, and if establishment really turns out a dog, I hope they'll forgive me, because I will say, this sucks. Um, I don't like the Rivals East Coast. Uh, OT makes a couple of great East Coast IPAs. That is not among them. That is honestly kind of a miss. If I was coming to the store, this theoretical customer that doesn't exist, and I was looking to learn about East Coast versus West Coast IPAs, and that's what I thought East Coast IPA was, I don't think I'd like East Coast IPA. So, yes, there's two of each in the, uh, in the Rival Pack. You lost me at country. Well, you know, you hey, can't hey, please everyone. That's right. I'll be honest, uh, the, the music, Aaron and I, so um, off camera, Aaron and I are both giant music nerds. So yes. one of the absolute delights of doing these uh, is usually we open a bottle of wine and then we absolutely Nerd. geek out so hard about music for what, like up, up to a couple hours, a couple of these weeks, just we just listen to bands we like and reminisce. And I got a couple uh, for fun. you this week. Um, do you remember karate? Yes. Yes. Don't yes. Even, anyway. I know. <laughs> anyway, so tonight's going to be fun. Tonight will be good. Uh, but yes. That's good. We're done. Uh, I like the right deal, but me to gimmicky better. Yes. Um, I wonder if this was maybe a suggestion by like an assistant brewer, and then they handed over making the beers to that person because OT does better East Coast IPA than this. They just do. I don't know where this came from. I don't know what's going on, but. Yeah, this was a bit of a miss. Also, if you love these beers, we now have them on sale for probably 50 cents above cost, because I bought a lot of them because I love the idea. <laughs> oh my god, that's better. Um, the snake likes just brilliant. It is good. <laughs> All right, so uh, that was a beer tasting, 25 in, and I had to go help a customer part way through. Yeah, yeah. That was fun. Um, yeah. Leaps and bounds. Okay, there you go. My need to stream the Aaron and Kyle music show. Oh, wow, that music, would be... Music shoe, excuse me. Yeah, that would be very sweary and um, a lot of, like, yelling about bands uh, at the top of our lungs as we take down audio and visual equipment and lights and spool cables and things like that. Opinions. A lot of unrequested opinions. <laughs> 
Okay. All right, so that was fun. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up there because we are getting way off topic and we have to talk about Karate the Band. Yes, uh, so, yes, Germany next week for beer. Uh, Franz Weniger's Wines this week for wine tasting in just 48 hours from now. Uh, until then, I'll either see you in 48 hours or in seven days, and I look forward to seeing you then. For the minute, I'm Kyle with Andrew Hilton. This was our uh, Rivals Week tasting, and I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Good night.